welcome this premiere to this premiere. This is the first entirely virtual Berkman Klein Tuesday luncheon event. Um, I'm Urs Gasser and I have the great pleasure to moderate this one hour session, both in principle and in practice, I hope. Um, as the announcement says, we will uh, take a closer look today at the many AI ethics and governance prim principles that have emerged across the globe over the past uh, few years. In the first part of the session, we will hear from Jessica Field, who's an assistant director of the Cyber Law Clinic here at Harvard Law and at Berkman Klein, who will share uh, some insights from her recent uh, principled AI report, uh, which provides a mapping and interesting analysis of, of norms. Um, we will hear from her about some of the common themes and threats across the different principles, as well as about um, also differences uh, uh, among them and maybe even gaps. Now we all know it's uh, one thing to write principles, but putting them into practice is a whole other story. Uh, and I'm therefore particularly grateful that Chess uh, and we all are joined by our colleague Ryan Budish, who's an assistant research director at the Berkman Klein Center, uh, who will highlight a few of these implementation challenges um, based also on his work as a member of OECD's AI governance expert group, which was one of the bodies uh, that came up with a set of, of principles. So I'm looking forward to, to both uh, opening presentations, which will of course uh, set the stage also for our uh, discussion afterwards. After these two opening statements, I'm really thrilled uh, to invite three respondents to join us. We have um, Talin Conde, we have um, Doa Abu El Nunes, and Vivek Krishnamurti. I will briefly introduce them um, after uh, the initial presentations. We will have a Q&A um, as well, although only virtual today. Um, please type your comments using the Q&A function, which I will monitor. I will then uh, select and hopefully also cluster some of your questions and share them uh, with our speakers. Uh, please also note that this session is recorded. We'll uh, share it uh, later on. Of course, um, we know this is a, a, a little bit of an experiment. We will uh, use uh, the webinar style mode for this lunch on, but we will also experiment with other um, uh, technologies and other modes uh, going forward. And if everyone who joins uh, could go on uh, mute to the extent is not a speaker, that would be great. And without further ado, I turn over to you, Chess. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm uh, delighted to be here um, with all of you. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to talk about um, the principled AI report that we put out in January. We had been looking forward to doing this um, as an in-person lunch uh, for a couple of months now. Um, and so uh, in this new world that we're all in, um, it's good to have this opportunity um, to discuss it. Uh, and I'm really looking forward um, to all of your questions and to our um, discussants reactions, as well as to the um, more practical perspective um, that Ryan brings. As we were discussing this event, we thought it would be really interesting to kind of go at AI principles, which have you know, come out on such a hot and heavy schedule for the past few years, um, both kind of from the macro view that the principled AI report takes, and then also from the micro view um, from Ryan's perspective, having been involved in the drafting of um, the OECD ones that are particularly influential. Um, so also thanks to um, Ruben, Megan, and Liz at Berkman for helping um, put this together. Um, and um, of course, my co-authors on the principled AI report, um, including Adam Nagy, um, Nelly Octon, um, Hannah Hillegas, Madalika Srikumar, um, and it was the rest of the research team who helped put this together. So um, principled AI was the result of a year long study of principles documents that um, set forth standards for socially responsible AI, which seek to ensure it will be uh, ethical and rights respecting, have a positive impact on the world. Um, as I noted, we released a white paper in January, which is available on the Berkman website. Um, and also this visualization. Now, if this visualization isn't immediately transparent to you, don't worry, um, I will be going through uh, all of it in a minute. Um, uh, 
I'm planning to talk for just under 10 minutes um, just to give you an overview of the project methodology and findings. And then, um, of course, happy to take your questions after Ryan's presentation. The top level finding that we have to share from Principal AI is that in spite of all the chatter um, and concern over the fact that um, there isn't really a vision for socially responsible AI, um, we were able to isolate uh, some real, some strong themes in the 36 documents that we looked at. Um, and we believe that they are the signs of, of the sort of earliest emerging um, consensus for, um, for societal norms around how AI um, can be, should be used. Now, of course, principles are just a piece of, of a governance um, and they um, should exist in a broader scope of governance that includes you know, everything from the everyday practices of professionals who are involved to this all the way up to um, law and regulation at multiple levels of government. Uh, so, um, Here's a timeline that shows um, all the documents uh, in the data set just in a slightly different way. You can see that the earliest one we have in the data set is from um, 2016, the tenets of the partnership on AI, and they go all the way up to late 2019. Um, the data set is a curated set of 26 docs that we assembled using um, what's called an expert or purposive sampling method. Um, so it, it is not an attempt to be comprehensive. We're aware of approximately 100 um, documents that would loosely fit our definition. Um, but what we wanted was a kind of manageable set. We knew that we wanted to build the data visualization um, and that we couldn't have too many documents on there or it would go from where it is now, which is uh, uh, challenging and intricate to um, basically unre unreadable. Um, and uh, we wanted nonetheless to be able to include um, the, uh, oops, sorry. Um, yeah. um, to include um, the a large number of documents. Um, so, hang on, here we go, back to my slide there. Um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, a variety of documents. So in terms of stakeholders, in terms of the timing of the, of the um, publication, um, I will note that our, we were hoping for um, variety in geography um, and we were able to achieve some. Um, but, for example, we were not able to find any documents from the continent of Africa. Um, we're aware of some that are in process, but there were none that fit our definition that were published at the time of the report. Um, and so that obviously marks um, a significant shortcoming um, in uh, our finding about the um, existence of a kind of global consensus. Um, so here you can see uh, one vision for one way to look at the um, variety within the data set. Um, we were particularly interested in having a variety of stakeholders represented because it was our hypothesis that this would be um, a significant area of variation um, between the data sets. Um, we also included, um, it's worth noting, documents that looked at AI as it AI technology generally, as it is applied in specific sectors, for example, the justice system or the workplace. Um, but we excluded documents that looked specifically at a particular type of AI technology, um, such as um, autonomous vehicles or facial recognition, um, because as we looked at those documents, they were just um, different in character than the generally applicable um, AI I sort of broadly applicable AI documents. Uh, also worth noting, not all the documents in our data set include the word principles. They don't all use that to describe themselves. Um, but uh, we, um, our understanding of that word, our definition of that word was documents that make uh, normative in the sense that it's used in the legal community. So uh, um, a sort of proscriptive statement about how, I, how AI ought to be used. We excluded empirical or observational documents, um, like for example, the re annual reports that come out from AI now, which have a lot of interesting um, insight on how uh, uh, AI is um, ethically used and deployed, um, but, uh, but don't sort of contain that, um, that normative um, statement. So um, let's go back to the data visualization now that you have a little bit of an understanding of what is represented here um, and look at how to read it. 
So each spoke uh, on this uh, visualization is one document, um, with the exception of uh, the OECD and G20 principles, which are represented on a single spoke because the G20 um, adopted the OECD principles more or less verbatim. The principles themselves verbatim, they excluded some of the descriptive text. Um, the uh, sector, the um, stakeholders are color coded the same as they were in the pie chart I showed you um, on a recent slide. So green is government, uh, orange is intergovernmental organizations, blue is multi stakeholder, pink is private sector, yellow is civil society. There um, are nine rings uh, in the visualization. The eight inner ones are the themes that we isolated. The outermost one is um, international human rights, where we collected data on whether or not the document mentioned human rights or explicitly uh, noted that it proceeded from a human rights law framework. Um, the framework documents are indicated by a star. The documents that mention human rights or, or related international instruments are a diamond. For the themes, you'll note that there are circles and that they are different sizes. The size of the circle corresponds to the percentage of principles in that theme that the document contains. So if there are 10 principles in the theme and the document hits all 10, it gets the largest size circle. If it hits just one, it gets the smallest size circle. Um, because there are different numbers of principles within each theme, it's instructive to compare um, within each ring, but not between the rings. Um, so what are these themes? Um, here, uh, we've zoomed in a little bit and you can see them better. Um, the eight themes in order of how frequently we see them appear in the documents are fairness and non-discrimination. Some principle related to fairness and non-discrimination appeared in every single document in our data set. Um, privacy is the next one, uh, and accountability. They were both in all but one uh, document. Uh, transparency and explainability, then safety and security, professional responsibility, human control of technology, and the promotion of human values. We got to these eight themes by hand coding every principle in the data sets, uh, in the data set, um, and then grouping like principles together. Um, so it was very interesting. At the same time we were working on this project, there were a couple of other sort of similar studies of principles, um, which all came up with a number of themes that are, you know, parallel ours in many ways, though everyone came up with a slightly different number. So for example, um, the report that came out from ETH Zurich has a theme called uh, beneficence that sort of loosely lumps together, I think, our promotion of human values um, and some of the accountability and safety and security principles. Um, so slightly differently divided, but I think um, researchers around the world are making similar observations. Uh, some people uh, have come to us with frustrations about the themes. For example, we've heard from a few people um, that they uh, wish that sustainability or environmental responsibility um, were sort of or more of a top level um, item. Uh, it is represented both in the, inter in the um, promotion of human values and the accountability principles, but um, because there wasn't a large number of, um, of principles under that heading, it didn't rise to the level of these themes. Um, so every, um, every principle has a different number, every, sorry, every theme has a different number of principles within it. This just lets you see um, a little bit better uh, what those are. Um, the accountability theme has the most, uh, the greatest number of principles within it. The promotion of human values and human control of technology themes have the fewest. Um, and uh, you can also scan this to kind of get a sense of the um, range in the themes, right? We see some that are uh, really big sort of consistently capital letter abstract concepts like equality um, under fairness and non-discrimination. Whereas we also see, you know, very particular policy recommendations like um, under transparency and explainability, the idea that there should be a notification when an AI makes a decision about an individual. So um, my last slide, just sort of what's next for this project? What's next um, for these observations? Um, 
I uh, like to think about it in terms of what is wrong with this chart. Now, this is a chart that shows the documents in our data set broken down by geography. Um, you can see that in spite of the fact that we built a multilingual research team with roots um, around the globe, um, we uh, nonetheless had the, the principles were dominated by North America and Europe. Um, with a substantial chunk, about a third, um, from East Asia, mostly China and, and a Japanese document. Um, we had one document each from India and from um, the MENA region, um, and then a handful of documents from Latin America. Um, I think what that means is that um, while those eight themes will be important in um, AI governance, we have a lot to do to expand the conversation to ensure that all of those who will be impacted by AI um, are weighing in on this governance piece. And because these principles, you know, for example, a word like equality, we just picked that up on the last slide, um, can mean very different things in different cultural contexts and to different people. Um, and because the people who are likely to be most strongly impacted by AI technologies are marginalized and vulnerable populations. I think it's absolutely key um, to continue um, to make this um, AI governance conversation accessible uh, to a broader number of people and, um, and to ensure that uh, the voices of uh, a really diverse um, set of, uh, of individuals are and, and organizations and governments are represented in it. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap up um, and really looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, I have a quick question that's coming up from Pat Mashri, and that mm -hmm. is in addition to some sort of the mapping of themes and, and the content of, of the principles, did you also map or analyze further what the underlying accountability mechanisms are? Not for those who design AI, but for those who design the principles. So are some of these principles more robust in terms of the inbuilt mechanisms for enforcement or oversight and others? And did you map that? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and uh, the, uh, I think the initial answer that occurs to me is that it really, it sort of goes stakeholder by stakeholder. So for example, you get something like um, the Toronto Declaration, right? Um, massively co-sponsored, organized though by Amnesty and Access Now, um, that is largely a coalition of civil society and individual and academic actors. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, accountability measures for an organization like that that's circulating principles. On the other hand, um, some of the government principles are adopted in the context of AI national strategies um, and do um, if there isn't sort of explicit um, uh, commitments immediately, at least include sort of recommendations for the study of adoption of new regulations. Um, so I'm thinking in particular about um, the German and British um, AI national strategies um, there that are sort of uh, like looking closer to uh, regulation. Um, worth noting though that uh, the actual, the first government to adopt um, regulation, which actually parallels these themes in many ways, um, was Canada, which did not produce a set of principles first. Um, it really did uh, just go straight for regulation, which governs um, uh, government bodies at, uh, acquisition of AI tools. So I hope that's helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll have more questions, but uh, I think this is a good moment to turn over to Ryan um, to share your perspectives. Uh, as Jess already indicated, what's of course ahead are all these hard implementation questions. And I was wondering whether you could share uh, your perspectives uh, based on your work uh, with OECD, but also beyond. Thank you, Ryan. Great. Uh, I am really excited to be a part of this uh, uh, experiment in uh, BKC events. Uh, so uh, thank you, as just said, uh, just to repeat uh, the thanks for the, for the BKC team that helped uh, make this uh, possible. Um, and uh, of course, it's always hard to, to follow Jess, uh, uh, but hopefully I think what, what I aim to cover here uh, should follow on uh, nicely with some of what 
she was sharing. And in particular, uh, I had two main objectives for what I wanted to cover in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, the first is that, you know, when you look at that uh, really amazing uh, visualization that, that Jess uh, created and her team created, uh, you know, you, you see all of these as finished, you see all of those principles as finished products. And uh, I actually wanted to provide a little bit of uh, some personal insight, uh, personal reactions to, um, to the process that I experienced being part of uh, the, uh, the AI uh, expert governance uh, group that the OECD created. Uh, in developing their their set of principles, uh, and then secondly, I wanted to sort of go uh, a little bit deeper into at least one of the uh, principles within that document uh, to highlight some of both the challenges and opportunities looking ahead as we think about moving from principle to practice. So as far as the uh, the process that the OECD went through. Uh, there were really uh, four stages. Uh, the first was that they created this group uh, that they called the IGO, the AI Group of Experts for the OECD. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more in a second about who was part of that group. Uh, and then, uh, and they met uh, four times. I was lucky enough to be a part of that group. Um, and uh, we met four times between 2018 and 2019. Uh, then the, the group uh, essentially drafted a set of, uh, of, of recommendations, but the, that was not the final step. Then that draft set of recommendations was then uh, passed up to the OECD's Committee on Digital Economy Policy. And then uh, that group uh, had the opportunity to revise the, the draft principles, uh, and reshape them uh, and then ultimately voted on them uh, and then sent them one level uh, higher to the OECD's ministerial uh, group. Uh, and then that group had a chance to continue to amend uh, the principles. And then it was uh, finally approved in June of, uh, sorry, June of 2019. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, in June of 2019, uh, that was finally uh, uh, approved. Now, in terms of the, uh, the composition of the, uh, of the uh, expert group, uh, there were 14 uh, what they called outside experts, invited outside experts. And those uh, individuals uh, uh, came from uh, academia and business. Uh, then there was another nine representatives from other OECD uh, committees and those representatives came primarily from civil society organizations, like those that focus on, uh, on labor issues or those that focus on privacy issues, uh, as well as additional representatives from business like IBM. Uh, and then there were 33 representatives or so from uh, OECD member states. Uh, and many of those people came from uh, from specific regulatory bodies within the uh, within those countries that have overall jurisdiction for issues uh, relating to emerging technologies or telecommunications issues. Now, within the OECD principles, there were really uh, two operative sections. Uh, one is was the principles for responsible stewardship of AI, and that really related to a set of values, things like transparency, human rights, uh, issues like that. And then there were national policies uh, and international cooperation for trustworthy AI, and that, that section related to principles uh, that governments would, uh, it was the audience for that half of the document was really governments. Uh, so that related to future of labor, data sharing, uh, making investments in AI research. And the document also contained a broad definition of an AI system. What does that mean to be, uh, to be an AI system? Now, as Jess uh, noted in her, uh, in her comments, the OECD document is uh, actually fairly unique in 
uh, in the influence and uh, adoption that it's had, uh, many of the principles uh, are important for the organization that created them. A company puts out a set of principles uh, that largely defines how they're going to uh, implement AI, but those principles in many cases don't have widespread influence. Uh, what one company says that they're going to do doesn't necessarily shape the whole industry. Uh, what makes the OECD principles uh, somewhat unique is that it was uh, the OECD process operates uh, on the basis of consensus. And so in order for it to be adopted, uh, all 36 OECD member countries uh, had to uh, agree to it. In addition, there were six non-member uh, countries that adopted it. And then shortly after it was adopted, uh, the G20 uh, adopted the, essentially adopted the OECD principles uh, verbatim. So I wanted to, as I said, to provide a little bit of sort of my own personal reaction to being uh, be, you know, being on the inside and seeing some of how this one set of, uh, of principles were, were created. And uh, there were really three, three things that I wanted to mention. First, uh, the framing of the process really matters. And by that, one, one example that I'll give is that the OECD framed the, the process as uh, principles to uh, to advance the adoption of trustworthy AI. And what you'll notice about that phrasing is that it has a very sort of positive pro-adoption bent to it. And that meant that, that certain things that I think are actually uh, uh, important parts of the conversation when we're thinking about AI, things like are there spaces where AI should not be used? Are there areas in which we think that AI should not be adopted uh, and should not be advanced, uh, that really wasn't in scope for what the uh, OECD was, was considering. So the initial framing was important for determining what kinds of principles could be in this document versus not. Secondly, there, the question of who ultimately decides who, who's the sort of final decision maker, I think is really, uh, is really important. And as you saw when I showed the, the sequence of events leading to the adoption of the OECD uh, principles, the group of experts who created the initial draft, we were not the ultimate audience for, for the principles. It was the member states that were ultimately going to have to adopt it. And so, uh, so what, we, what at least I saw from the process was that it was really designed in many ways to try to uh, reach the end of the process where there was something that the member states would be able to, to adopt uh, and would be comfortable adopting. And so you could certainly have imagined uh, alternate uh, processes that they could have gone through that uh, that would have yielded a very different document that ultimately, uh, again, because of the consensus-driven nature of the OECD process, never would have been approved by all of the uh, final decision makers. And so I think there was a real uh, conscious uh, uh, decision to design the process in a way to get to something that could be approved. And that really gets to my final point that the conveners and the, uh, the staff at the OECD who was doing a lot of the drafting in between meetings and responding to comments really had a lot of, of power in terms of, of how they, they, they structured the process in order to try to get to that end point. And so I think it's certainly fair to have uh, some criticisms about the OECD process, whether it's questions about who, who was invited to the table or the sort of uh, uh, should AI always be uh, adopted and, ad and advanced, those kinds of questions. I think it's totally fair to, to have criticisms of the, uh, of, the, of the process and of the, uh, the document. But, uh, but ultimately, I think as measured by, the, uh, by how I think the, the OECD 
viewed it uh, as reaching a point where it could be adopted and ultimately implemented by uh, by the the countries that adopted it, I think it really was successful in that in that regard. So uh, next, I just really wanted to quickly give a little bit of an example of uh, of some of the challenges and uh, opportunities uh, by looking at one specific part from the the principles relating to transparency and explainability, and. The first thing that I wanted to highlight here is that there's uh, four subparts to this principle, but really when you look at the, the first three uh, subparts are really all about uh, advancing understanding. And you can see that, that the key words are uh, foster a general understanding of AI systems, awareness, understanding the outcome. And so uh, the, these first three are really not about changing AI systems, but really uh, helping people understand how they're interacting with AI systems. It's this uh, last piece, really, the, the fourth subsection that really uh, actually is the, the most challenging in some ways, because it, it's, it's about creating a way for people to challenge uh, outcomes that may be adverse. But when you start to read it, it actually, uh, in many ways, raises more questions than it gives answers. For instance, it says that uh, uh, it talks about people adversely affected by AI systems. Well, what does it mean to be adversely affected? What if, uh, what if you don't even know that you've been adversely affected? Or what if uh, the system actually performs better than its human counterparts, but uh, but compared to certain other people, your, your uh, impact was less, uh, less good than others. So what it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, concept. To challenge its outcome, what does that mean? Is it uh, in the moment? Uh, is there some sort of appeals process? Is it uh, a human review? Uh, what does it mean to challenge the outcome? Based on plain and easy to understand information, uh, you know, based in different contexts, different kinds of information might be more or less relevant. And, you know, for instance, is it uh, the, the single factor that was most important in the decision? Is it the top 10 factors that were most important in the decision? Uh, is it the one factor that if changed the least would alter the outcome? Any of these could, could be, depending on the context, the most important kinds of information. And finally, the logic that served as the basis for the prediction. Does that mean the source code? Does that mean the training data that, that helped create a machine learning system? You know, that, so, so there's, you know, all of these terms raise a lot of questions and that's not, they're, they're all answerable, but this document on its own doesn't necessarily help uh, someone figure out how to answer those. And there are certainly other organizations that are out there that are thinking about these issues, uh, but it sort of creates more work for someone who's trying to think about uh, how to comply with these principles that then they have to start to try to answer as many of these complex questions. So the OECD recommendations are non-binding, um, but the OECD does have uh, monitoring capacity in collecting data, and some of that data is being uh, uh, collected at the recently launched AI Policy Observatory. And I think the OECD themselves, they've created a new, uh, some new groups to help really think about uh, how do we move from, from these principles to practice, recognizing that, that, that there are a lot of unanswered questions right now, that these principles in many ways do provide a helpful agenda uh, to uh, governments and to organizations that are thinking about how to move forward, but uh, recognize also that, that they really raise uh, even more questions. Um, so I think that, that that's really where, where we are at this, at this particular moment. So I'll stop. I'll stop there so that we can get to the uh, to the questions. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, there are maybe two quick questions, uh, and I ask for short answers. So, one is, who is the intended audience or the users uh, 
for these of these principles. Maybe Jess, you can take this one. And then there is a question by Nagla um, uh, with regard to the OECD process uh, in particular, whether there have also been non-AI experts uh, involved in the consultations. Jess, do you want to take the yeah, first one? Yeah, happy to. Um, so it's interesting, this was actually a piece of data that we collected on each of the um, documents in our data set, um, and then ultimately like didn't find a great way to represent it in the data visualization. Um, but we were curious in the in what we could glean from the text of the principles themselves about who the anticipated audience was, right? Was it policymakers? Was it individuals, you know, users or affected folks? Was it companies and the private sector? Uh, or others, academics, for example. Um, so uh, there was a significant variety. Um, I think it's sort of perhaps the most notable ones are the private sector documents are often um, sort of have two purposes, right? One audience is internal. Um, so organizations, you know, like Google and Microsoft and others that have adopted these types of principles have also built teams who are responsible for ensuring that the um, development and deployment of AI within the organization corresponds to the principles that they've circulated. So the documents are internal facing to some degree, right? They're persuasive and binding more or less on um, the teams within those organizations, but they're also external facing, right? They also have a PR function. Um, and so they're aimed at us um, and perhaps at policymakers um, and others um, to the extent that, you know, that's the sort of ethics washing argument that's often made that like um, when private sector organizations adopt these principles, it is in part to make an argument that they're, um, the regulation is perhaps less necessary because the organizations are doing it themselves. Um, so uh, certainly with those, those documents, you know, I think we see the, the sort of primary audience as being, uh, well, I suppose it depends on who you are and what your perspective is, how skeptical you are, uh, whether you think that the primary audience is inside of the private sector organization or whether you think the primary audience is the kind of PR or, um, staving off policy function um and i, just, I think that's that's, that's good okay. yeah thank you ryan do you want to uh respond to nagla's question please yeah so uh i think the the question was about whether non-ai experts were consulted in the process and actually i think it's uh it's a little bit more the the reverse that uh the the title of the group uh, the AI experts governance, uh, AI, uh, AI, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a misleading title because I would actually say that most of the participants uh, were, uh, came from, from uh, different kinds of policy backgrounds, legal backgrounds. There were certainly some people who were part of the 50 some uh, people in the, uh, in the group who had uh, computer science and uh, AI specific uh, expertise, uh, but, uh, but the majority actually uh, brought very different uh, perspectives to it. Um, and I can talk more about that later if there are other questions relating to it. Yes, thank you, that's great. Um, uh, Ryan and Chess, there are a number of other questions coming up in the Q&A uh, box. And, and if you would be so kind to respond to those that you feel you can um, respond right away, we'll return to those in a minute. But I wanted to really um, ask to the floor, to the virtual floor, um, our respondents. Um, Mutale, you're the CEO of AI for the People. You're a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, you have done a, a lot of work focusing essentially on the unequal impact that these next generation technologies have on, on, of people from different backgrounds and in different uh, circumstances and in different geographies. And I was wondering, you know, uh, as, as Ryan said, there are all these open questions and now where do we take it from here? And, and how do you see your work fitting into uh, this question of, of principles and, and practice of AI? My first question was the report was very rights based um, in terms of how you're thinking about AI going forward. Much of my work looks at equity, which is a different type of lens. And uh, given that we have shorter time and I could probably speak about this for seven years, um, I was wondering whether there was any conversation around equity based, uh, 
and I'm thinking specifically of neg negatively racialized communities that want rights, but also have this equity deficit. That was very, very fast. Do you want to add two sentences about yep. your, your work? And Jess, we will collect a, a few statements and then uh, open it yep. back up. Yep. Um, I can qualify why equity was so important. Um, for me, I was doing this, this work. I was a practitioner in Congress, the US House of Representatives. And I spent a lot of education time really letting uh, lawmakers in the US know that hu often human rights frameworks are not looking at the reality that if we if we ignore phenomenon like anti-black racism and how that impacts the deployment of AI, I'm thinking specifically in this moment of Corona, I live in a city where the police are now thinking about using um, a biometric technologies to figure out who's social distancing. Finding somebody who is white and rich is very different from finding somebody who is poor and black, but the, it's one principle. And that's just a very concrete example of why thinking about equity in terms of impact is something that I very much dedicated my work towards. And I would love to know whether this was a consideration um, in the report. Thank you so much, uh, Mutali, and we'll, we'll return to that after hearing from, from a few others, but also thank you for your important work in, in this field. Um, it's really um, great to learn from you. And um, I was wondering whether uh, Vivek, uh, who joined us in the meantime, who's a law professor at the University of Ottawa, where he leads the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, also a former um, Berkmanite, uh, you've done a lot of work from a human rights perspective, uh, working with companies and um, thinking hard about um, the intersection of technology and human rights and building on some of these questions um, that were so nicely uh, framed by, by Mutali. I was wondering where you see some sort of the rights uh, frameworks coming into play, but also possible limitations of such a framework. And it's good to see you, by the way. Yes, it's great to see you Urza, under these uh, interesting circumstances. Uh, so I'm delighted we could be here virtually. Um, yeah, so I've worked again on, on technology and human rights for a long time. And I see the value of human rights approaches. I, I've seen them actually be, in, be quite transformative inside companies with regard to, let's call it the web 2.0 set of human rights problems. And I think companies are, are grappling with what do we do with this very wide set of technologies, right? Our algorithmic systems and AI, if you think about it, are a cluster of technologies and, and a lot of the human rights impacts are particular to the use of that technology in a use case, right? And that presents a challenge for companies that are trying to use their, let's say, global network initiative, and that's something I've been very involved in, era tools to uh, assess human rights risk and, uh, uh, and, and apply it to this open-ended set of systems. So just a step back though, I mean, I think there's a lot of value in the in human rights approaches AI, and I'm really glad to see. I think the report that Jess and colleagues put out is incredibly helpful. The visualization, just in sort of showing how different human rights conceptions are found in different principles, is is incredibly useful as a descriptive measure to show what the landscape is. But to me, from a normative perspective. The value of human rights, you know, even in these challenged times, is that they do provide a baseline set of understandings. Um, you know, their law, for one thing, uh, that states have, have generally accepted that they feel that there's an obligation to respect these things. And there's a normative framework there, uh, a, a common way to talk about our problems, even if we don't agree with what the solutions are. Um, now, I think the hard challenge, and I, I, I alluded to this before, I think this is reflecting the title of this event today, is how do we take those various articulations of principles, right, high-level human rights principles, the more granular principles that the OECD, that the companies that uh, your report has shown, and uh, provide practical guidance, right, to uh, different actors in the AI stack as to what their human rights responsibilities are based on differential impacts and different use cases. And I think that's a nut we haven't cracked yet. And it's a really difficult nut to crack um, because of the diversity uh, of, of the tools and of the use cases, right? So I think that's a, it's a really difficult human rights challenge uh, 
uh, that we're at the early stages of thinking about. But I actually think that all the work that's happening makes me quite hopeful because we are thinking about it at an early, well, still relatively early stage of the uh, development and implementation of these technologies. Uh, I'll leave it there. That's very helpful and, and also a, a good reminder how much context matters in these discussions. And, and it may be a great segue to, to Doha, who's an SJD candidate here at the uh, law school and has done a lot of work, not only actually at the OECD, uh, but also studying the use of algorithms in the criminal justice system. And I was wondering, Doha, whether that is a, a, an initial use case, whether it's AI properly or, um, or algorithm more broadly, where, of course, many of these questions around fairness and transparency and bias uh, are at play. At play. And um, with Wevex reminder that this is still a relatively early stage, uh, how helpful are um, principles like the ones we've been discussing today in the work uh, that's uh, front and center in your research? Uh, thank you, Urs, and hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. It's uh, funny, they say if you have uh, lemons, make a lemonade. So in the normal world, I probably wouldn't be able to join because I'm not uh, in Cambridge, but uh, it's good to have the opportunity to be here. Uh, I want to divide my uh, observation uh, into two. In the first one, I will uh, wear the hat of someone who was working in the OECD uh, in part, uh, part of the time where the uh, principles were considered and the expert group was uh, meeting. And then the second is like the academic hat of, of someone who is thinking about the regulation of uh, AI. So, uh, for the first part, so as Ryan said, the OECD operates on the basis of consensus and reaching a consensus between so many uh, members and other actors in the field, it is a hard job. Um, so the principles are broad, if indeed. And one of my favorite exercises is to give this list of principles to someone who is from the field of computer science and to see, oh, what do you make out of it? And usually the answer is like, not much. And, um, but I want to emphasize that although it is hard, the, the, the principles raise more questions uh, than answer, perhaps it's a good thing because we don't want to be too limiting in the approach that, um, especially if, if so many countries are adopting those principles, um, we, we want to give the, the room for uh, either countries or uh, yeah, companies and everyone to adapt it uh, to their needs. Uh, but the OECD, um, but the principles, so they have a very important, I think, a declaratory purpose. They kind of put the important topics uh, up front and then the implementation into practice is, is kind of, uh, will be discussed later on. Um, as probably some of you recall, the OECD has been very powerful in shaping regulation around privacy, starting from the 1980, the, the council similar um, in the same way that AI principles uh, were adopted in a council recommendation. There was a council recommendation on privacy. And this has been shaping uh, the privacy regulation around the world uh, massively. So it can have an impact. Um, now, as an academic who is thinking about the regulation um, of AI, I think the hard part is to kind of think what is the, how do we balance between all the principles and not just how, I, I try to look at several case studies from criminal justice, from welfare, uh, and to how to not just unpack each one of the principles, but how to balance between all the principles. Are they all, uh, do they, do, is there any hierarchy between the principles? Is there any difference? Where is all the discussion that we have in the legal world about checks and balances? Let's say that, for example, I'm doing uh, very well on the transparency in a certain case. 
uh, do I need to comply with the others similarly? I think what is lacking at this point, and I'm hoping that with the development of more and more case studies, is that we'll see this conversation uh, being developed, not just only what is fairness mean in each context, but how to kind of look at all the prints, the, the, yeah, the guidelines simultaneously, the requirements simultaneously, and what to make out of that. I'll, I'll stop here. This is super helpful. Thanks for sharing your perspectives, both from the inside and as a researcher. Uh, it's great um, to, to have you here. Um, we have a number of, of comments and questions. And uh, before giving it back to Jess and Ryan for some sort of a concluding remark, since we have only eight minutes left, I wanted to maybe ask uh, Padmashri to uh, share your observations that you also put in the Q&A, but it's just uh, also nice to have you, your voice live here. And then Amy Johnson will be next. And I hope I can unmute you. Padma, are you here? Yes, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. Thank you, Urs, and, uh, and thank you, everybody, um, uh, especially Ryan and Jessica for presenting, and I'm really happy um, to be part of this. Um, so the, the, the question I asked, and um, I think that maybe, and I think it's a relevant point, is that whether, on, whether we should reflect on um, if a human rights framework is, is not contextualized in terms of new inequalities, considering that a lot of the human rights principles that we are considering today, they were created 70 years ago or 70 or so years ago. And there are new kinds of inequities and inequalities in society. Of course, you yourself have written a paper about digital rights and the different kinds of digital rights that have been actually uh, proposed. And I think that there's a need to have a discussion on what kind of new thinking we need about contextualizing a human rights framework to AI and inequalities and inequities of the kind we see now. And what about the people who are normally not part of this conversation? How do we take them on board? Thank you, Padma. And uh, Dennis Redeker, who's the lead author of the paper you kindly mentioned, is, is also uh, on this call. I'm so sorry they have so little time. Um, but uh, we will hopefully weave it all together. So Amy, do you want to share your question or your thoughts as well? And then I turn it over to, to Jess and, and Ryan. I was wondering about the uh, question around the adversely affected. Um, the scales of these systems and the effects of these systems are so large that it seems odd to me that the only form of challenge would be the person who was directly harmed. And so I'm curious if there is consideration of other folks, whether it's a bystander intervention style or some other kind of method of challenge, um, if that was under consideration, and if not, why not? Excellent, thank you. So uh, uh, Jess and Ryan, no small task in five minutes to talk about rights-based versus equity-based approaches, question of hierarchy among principles, uh, and ultimately also uh, the question of interventions and bystanders, over to you. Oh, yeah. Well, it is a tall order in um, in five minutes. Um, I'll just, uh, coming out of this report, which of course is like a deep dive into the principles themselves, mention a couple of principles um, that came up for me in this conversation. So um, one, we have a cat under um, fairness and non-discrimination. We have a principle called inclusiveness in design. It was really interesting to see how some of the different principles documents interpret it. So um, some of them interpret that idea as basically just like we should build more diverse design teams, right? Include more women and minorities on design teams. Um, but there are a few documents um, of which the IEEE, um, uh, ethically acceptable design, um, is the um, ethically aligned design, is the like perhaps um, primary one that actually think about inclusiveness in design as um, in more of an equity than a rights framework. So it's not about the design teams, it's actually about designing technologies such that they allow for broader participation um, than the present state of things. Um, and while um, Mutale brought um, a race-based frame to it, which I think is incredibly important, um, the case that the IEEE document highlights is um, actually disability rights. Um, so how could 
uh, AI technologies be designed to build a world that's more inclusive um, for folks who are hearing or vision challenged. Um, so that's one principle that I wanted to bring up. Um, from the perspective of Amy's question, which is I think a wonderful one, um, and, and uh, highlights a shortcoming in, um, in sort of current US law, at least speaking as a US lawyer, right, where um, if you have a sort of very small harm as a member of a large group who are, who are harmed in small ways, you sometimes have standing problems in actually bringing a lawsuit to enforce those rights. Um, the sort of equivalent of a bystander type um, enforcement that we observed is that quite a number of documents, I think um, almost half the documents in the data set recommend some sort of um, exterior audit or evaluatory function um, so that uh, and that's it's interesting to think about how that might take shape in um, various jurisdictions around the world um, whether in administratively or otherwise um, so that's I think a sort of space to watch and, and a group that could function in that kind of bystander role um, with with civil servants thank you just Ryan your thoughts on some of these questions Thanks. So uh, I actually wanted to come back to something that that, that Doa said, because I think it's a really important point to emphasize is that I think when you look at, for instance, the OECD principles, it's really uh, a stake in the ground. It's not it's not it's not an, an end point uh, in itself, but I think it it provides direction, hopefully, to 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 nation to other nations and to to organizations that are thinking about uh, about these kinds of questions. Um, and I think really that's what a lot of these principles are. Um, and, uh, and so I think that one of, there, there's sort of two, two interesting things. You know, one relates to Amy's question that, uh, that when, you, when you read these principles, there's both the sort of uh, the specifics of, you know, why, why isn't there, you know, bystander rights, but, uh, but viewed, you know, two steps back, looking at it as this sort of uh, marker, uh, it's really more of a question of how do we build a, a effective accountability mechanisms? And it provides some ideas on how to do that, but uh, there's obviously many ways to actually implement it in practice. And, uh, and things like bystander, uh, right may may be part of a more comprehensive approach, and I think related to that, uh, my my other observation is that I think one thing that I'm interested in seeing is to what extent do things as we move from these principles to practice, to what extent do they become differentiated in different contexts? So there may be some some cases where the 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 right to challenge as articulated in the OECD principles is actually good enough. But there may be other other domains, other areas of application where a very different approach is going to be uh, necessary. And so I think it'll be interesting to watch going forward uh, whether there's sort of forks taken in the road and different approaches that vary depending on context and how these sets of principles uh, are used or, uh, or, or not in thinking about those differentiations. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, I also want to acknowledge we have a number of, of additional questions and inputs on, on the Q&A in the Q&A window, and I'm sorry that we're running out of time. I want to acknowledge, however, briefly what, what Julie wrote there, and um, which may be one of these contexts Ryan is talking about real time, what's happening now in the COVID-19 crisis, how will AI be um, deployed to uh, combat this particular public health crisis, um, how robust are these safeguards, or at least um, norm statements that, that Jess was presenting and, and Ryan discussing too. So I, I do think this is kind of a, a first dramatic real world test uh, of what we have been discussing a little bit in the abstract today, but that gets uh, concrete very quickly. So I'm sorry we're running out of time, but it was uh, a wonderful one hour with all of you. Thanks so much, um, uh, Jess uh, and Ryan, Mutale, Doa, Vivek, the entire BKC team who um, made this possible. Thanks to 
uh, all the participants for listening in and uh, please be in touch and uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you.